All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Ice Team Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Durham. And today I'm sitting at the historic Rutgers Birchmont Lodge here on the shores of Lake Bemidji. You can't see it from here, but we are overlooking the lake. Uh, but what you can see is this profile of a man in front of me. <laughs> I'd like to introduce everybody to my good friend, Jason Rylander. Jason, thanks for sitting with me. Thanks for having me and breaking the microphone stand. And <laughs> good thing I'm pretty good with crafting things and made myself a microphone holder. Yeah, I, I knew you were good at arts and crafts and that's pretty crafty for sure. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that you were going to hold it. I was going to bring a long microphone like Bob Barker used to do on The Price is Right. Oh, long skinny? Yeah, long, long <laughs> skinny. <laughs> Holds it down by his belly button? Yeah. Talks right into it. Perfect. Well, if, if you're unfamiliar with Jason Rylander, uh, if you're listening to the podcast and not watching it, all you have to do is imagine if Zach Galifianakis and Nick Offerman had an offspring together and that's exactly what he looks like. So, and if you don't know who Nick Offerman is, he's the guy that's Ron from Ron Swanson, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. I know so. more. I know more than you. <laughs> that's my favorite episode. <laughs> well, I thought that uh, to start out with, we'd get you warmed up a little bit mm. because I I need you to be very articulate for this episode. Oh, okay. And so we're gonna do a little word association to start out with. Okay. Go ahead. So all I want you to do is say the first word that comes to mind after I say the word. Okay. okay? Here we go. What if it's a swear word? I shouldn't swear. Try not to. Okay. Cheese. Sure. Bacon. Ham. Cheese. <laughs> Shamazels. Struggle stuff. Onomatopoeia. Yesterday. Molly coddling. Holly. Zizzy fusses. Purple trees. Okay, I think you're ready. Well, I know a lot of people know your background, but give us just a brief background of where you came from. What do you do? <laughs> Jason, what do you do? Uh, much as little as possible. <laughs> um, grew up in West Central Minnesota, small town of Ashby between Fergus Falls and Alexandria. And on the south end of that beautiful Otter Tail Lakes country. Uh, moved up to Bemidji, and I've now been here longer than I've lived than I lived in Ashby. So I'm officially a local. I've been told. And uh, sold rice for a few years. Guided part time. Still kind of guiding part time with Matt Brewer. And just recently started uh, working for a beer distributor in town, which beats the hell out of selling quinoa. <laughs> uh, which beer company? Burnix. They're based out of St. Cloud, so uh, if it's not an Anheuser-Busch product, I probably sell it. Got it. I I'm, noticed... enjoying, I'm enjoying a beautiful, lovely winter IPA from our local Bemidji Brewing, which I do distribute and work with, and this is one of the last kegs we have in town, so... I'm getting it while I still can because I really like this one. Well, I noticed the hat said Bemidji Brewing. Bre Brewing. <laughs> Matt, that would be Matt Brewing. Matt Brewing. And then I've got my green belt hoodie on today because I came right from work to this. And uh, another wonderful Minnesota made beer down in New Ulm where my wife is from. Shells, Shells Brewery. And the cool thing, your wife has a connection here at Rutgers. She's the operations manager. That's why we didn't get kicked out. Yet. Yet. The night's young. Oh, well, the owner was here. She saw us. She's, she still likes me, so we're good. I think it's cool. I walked in, and there's a couple dogs wandering around. You can hear the music in the yeah. background. Yeah, it's a Wednesday night. There's live music. Gal sitting, playing guitar, and singing songs. You can kind of should be able to pick it up in the background of what we got going on here. People will be able to hear it. Yeah, it's a very cool establishment. They spent a lot of money renovating this old lodge, and... Uh, quite the treat for to have on Bemidji. I mean, it's historic. It's been here for, I don't know how many years. That's over a hundred. I've yeah. stayed at one of the cabins before. It Me was too. cool. It Me was too. Cool. <laughs> I suppose you get a discount. 
Yeah, I think so. I Sometimes. did. I did not get a discount. You probably did. Yeah. My wife likes you. Yeah, I actually did. Uh, so everybody I know that's listening knows you for bur- for eel pout, burbot. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Why is right now the best time to fish for eel pout? It's the the pre spawn. They're grouped up, so it's numbers. It's a numbers game. You can now's the best time of year to go catch. 20, 30, 40, however long, late you want to stay up if they're biting. Great time of year for the numbers. So then, on the other hand, why is right now the worst time in terms of fishing for the eel. species itself? Why is it the worst time for the eel pout? Because they're spawning. They're super vulnerable, super, super vulnerable. Um, they're making their babies, and I am going to get more aggressive about talking about conservation of the species because I was thinking about it the other night when I was fishing. When I first started fishing them, I was pretty much by myself a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, there wasn't a ton of guys out doing it, and it was easy isn't the right word because it took a lot of work to find spots, but when you find the fish, it was bang, 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 and the last handful of years it is, I mean, there's, there's more pressure, there's more people fishing them, which is awesome. Um, it's making the species more, more known, known and some conservation efforts coming, but they are so, so susceptible right now. And, and after doing some research, you know, finding out they're laying their eggs here and those eggs are on the bottom of the lake for four to six weeks before they hatch. You've got crayfish, perch, cisco, whitefish, to name a few things that are gonna eat those eggs on top of just eggs not getting fertilized or whatever happens. And I really think, I don't think they're prolific spawners. I mean, just look at the populations of the species in, in a lot of our lakes, it's not, there's not a ton of eel pout on Lake Bemidji. Right. Not, not, I don't hear the, I always heard the stories before I went to college here, these, these guys that are five, 10 years older than me that used to go out and 40, 50 fish nights, and I think they were killing them. Like my best night on Lake Bemidji ever is like six or eight fish. Mm-hmm. Nowhere near 40. Right. And, and I think it's really important. I mean, yeah, they're a ton of fun to catch. Go out and do it. Think about, think about letting them go, especially those females. It's, it's important if, if we're going to keep these around and my kids and your kids and grandkids and whatever are going to have the species be able to catch here locally, it's important to let them go. I totally agree. And I, I think about even just the care after you catch them. I mean, I think people in their minds think they're a lot tougher than they are right and they're a fish uh, they're a fish look at look at the way somebody treats a muskie now when they catch it versus years ago and with the old pout i mean there's times where people get a, a hook in them and they're you know tearing it out and not being careful where muskie anglers they're cutting hooks off they right. have special tools along to make sure to ensure that that species and that single fish survives but eel pout anglers are a little bit behind in that. Right, and I think, you know, you go out and you catch 20 eel pout and you think, well, I'm gonna keep six, it's not a big deal. Okay, well, that's almost half of what you caught. And, you know, some of these, some of the lakes that I've been fishing now in the last few years, the thing that's strange to me is I'm not catching smaller fish. Mm-hmm. Good example, and I'll, I'm gonna name a lake. Gull Lake and Brainerd. Yep. I don't know if I've ever caught a two pound fish out of there. What's what's going on there? Is that, are those smaller fish doing something different where you're just not seeing them in those areas? Or are they uh, non-existent? Right. Right, I mean that lake's lake's changed with uh, zebra mussels, different things. Is that that affected spawning habitat? Whatever, you look at Cass Lake, excellent eel pout lake, lots of eel pout in there. Also, a bajillion rusty crayfish. Yeah. So that does two things. The eel pout have a pile to eat. 
why would they eat my jig when all they have to do is swim along the bottom with their mouth open? And it's like a combine eating lobster-sized crayfish. Two, they drop their eggs. We're catching crayfish out to 50 feet of water. Those crayfish are going to take care of that opportunity. Find those eggs, they're going to munch them up for sure. All this stuff's having an effect on their spawn, and with such little research being done, I mean, obviously I'm speculating, but I've also been fishing for them for 15 years, and I've, I'm, I'm seeing patterns, I'm seeing shifts, for sure. I would agree with you. And there's one lake that you and I fish where now, you were talking about not seeing smaller fish on Gull Lake, there's a lake you and I fish that now we're seeing a lot more small fish and we're not seeing those bigger fish like we used to. Right. And we're seeing a lot more angling pressure. Right. And that's, I mean, selective harvest. It's, especially this time of year, it's pretty easy to tell when a male bites or when you land a male. Right. I mean, it's going to give you the, uh, yeah. you know, the one, the two, signs. Well, the one signs. two and let you know what it is. <laughs> You know, I caught one the other night, a, a small one uh, that actually had eggs coming out of it. And we're looking at, I mean, today is March 1st. So it's, it's now, it's, it's not, uh, by no means is it too early for them to be spawning. No, no. But it's always, I, I, I guess, it's kind of like the, the first snowfall of the year right. when you catch that first eel pout that uh, is actually spawning. Well, and, and to get back on my thigh horse, my little stand or whatever, it's March 1st. That fish lays its eggs today. There's a chance they don't hatch into baby eel pout until mid-April. Right. Think that's about a, that. That's a long time. You're an egg just laying there. You don't have little arms to punch that perch in the face that's coming over to eat you. You're, you're done. Right. And that's a long time to lay there. So, like, I, I really think they're... They don't, if they lay a million eggs, there ain't 10,000 that probably your catch. It, I, I really firmly believe that they're, uh, it's a small number that hatch and grow up to be reproductive adults. I agree with that. It'll be so interesting to see as we progress into the future, the research that the DNR does and continues to do on these fish, because I think there's a lot that we still have yet to learn about them. There's a ton to learn. Well, before we get into... It was a really depressing opening segment, wasn't it? I was... That? Well, you, you especially made... Especially for us. You made it You made Well, it I wanted super to get depressing. on my platform, and, and you know what? I'm glad you did. Damn it. That's the thing is gold. <laughs> yeah. And don't get me wrong, they're delicious, but there's just too much unknown. And without limits, it, just what I've seen on the, on the handful of lakes that I've spent a lot of time on, it's... Uh, in a short time, it's changed a lot. I agree. Well, I thought I'd do things a little bit different for this podcast. And so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm actually going to have a little call-in segment. So we're going to allow people to call in. Okay, is my mom calling? She might be. Okay. <laughs> she might be. I don't know. Uh, but if you, if you want to put a call in, it's uh, 218 252 Two two seven eight. Is this live? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I thought we were recording. And he posted it later. No. Let's see. All right. Here we got our first. No wonder you didn't want me to, s to we, swear. We got our first call here. Hold on. Yeah. Hi there, guys. Uh, long time listener, big fan, big fan of you, Jason Rylander. I've been following you for a long time, man. You're funny. You make me laugh. I'm just getting into eel pout fishing and uh, want to learn more about it. So this question's for Jason Durham. Yeah, uh, what's your favorite bait for the eel pouts? Oh, hey, thanks for calling in, man. Um, my favorite bait, you know, I love just a big spooner, a big jig, and gobbing up some minnows on it. Uh, Rylander, do you have a favorite type of minnow? He uh, asked you the question. Oh, okay. Uh, so I like <laughs> I like shiners. <laughs> Fat heads, uh, rain, rainbows. Actually, rainbows Tip have become one of my favorites. Typically, this time of year, I kind of take what I can get. Yeah. Uh, but ideally, ideally, I really like the golden shiners. I think it's oily. The scales kind of fall off. 
Mm -hmm. And then I've kind of, whether there's any truth to it or not, but it sure makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. I like to use scents. Yeah. And I'll give you, I'll give you one guess, Jason, on what my favorite scent to put on my bait is. Your own pheromones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Copenhagen <laughs> and Miller Lite. No, crayfish. Crayfish. Shocker, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Right. You've had some stinky uh, scents over the years. I've messed with... Was that first one I ever bought to mess with? First one I ever bought to mess with, you know, just being... I was just keying in on stinky stink. Like, I was... I think early on I was thinking more catfish. Like, yeah. they just want something smelly. Not... Like, a couple years later, like, hey, dummy... <laughs> Why didn't you just use the scent on the thing that they like to eat? But it was a uh, garlic bloody tuna. Yeah, I remember that one. That one was pungent. Did, did you spill that in your truck? I think it got in the pocket of my bibs. It is bad. They don't. Those little Procure bottles don't seal perfectly. All right, hold on. We got another call. Oh, hold on. Well, hi there, fellas. Oh, you sound good looking. My name's Laura. Hi, Laura. And I'm just getting into eel pout fishing. And I was wondering, what depth should I go to to catch the most eel pout? Since I want the best information, this question's for Jason Durham. Oh, hey, thanks for calling, Laura. You know, I like to fish depths anywhere from about 20 feet out to about 35 or so. I do go a little bit deeper, but I'm trying to get away from that deep, deep water. I'm 100% with you. Yeah, and, you know, we used to go a little bit deeper, and it was it was almost like there was no limit. I think the deepest I've caught is 62 feet. Right. But, again, with learning about the species, I think barotrauma has a 100%. detrimental effect. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's a thing. I think it affects them a little bit less than some of the other species, but it does affect them. And... And Laura, to answer your question appropriately, Jason kind of skirted it a bit, but uh, depth's very lake dependent. Um, I've, I've fished Eelpout in lakes that like max depth's like 40, that's 45 feet. So that's gonna be kind of relative then. I might be fishing them as shallow as six, 12, whatever. Uh, lake Bemidji, I've caught them as shallow as uh, 11 feet during the spawn and Cast Lake, during the spawn. I've, I've seen spawn balls happening in 21, 23 feet of water. Yeah, leech is another good example. Uh, they, yeah, 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 then, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think you could go catch an eel pout on leech in six feet of water, and the same day catch one in eighty. Yeah, they're they're just they're there, they're everywhere. But I liked what you said. That thirty foot range is usually a pretty good starting point for me on most lakes because they're. I'm targeting deep, clear bodies of water, uh, but yeah, 25 to 30 is a good starting point. I think it's a good starting point. Well, now these guys get... You're going to this, you're this, gonna have to wait. There's another call coming. Oh, Hold good on. grief. Hi there. My name is James. And this question is for Jason Rylander. I've talked to this guy before. Is it sometimes hard? What do you mean? Like hard to get out of bed in the morning? Or just like hard to get up out of a chair? Come on, James. I mean... I, I've talked to this guy before. He called me on Paul Bunyan Country. Um, he actually did the interview. Weird. Uh, he's, a, he's a jerk. And I think that was a fat joke. And James, I suffer from arthritis very, very bad. My knees are shot. I thought it was gout. Gout is arthritis. Oh, I stand corrected. Sorry. But gout's wrecked my knees to a point where now they're arthritic. Okay, so anybody calling in, let's not pick on Rylander, okay? We'll, we'll take one more. Got to answer it. How come these people all have terrible voices? They sound really weird. Well, hi there. Hi. Did you call and from a potato? I, I love to cook. And this question is for Jason Rylander. I was wondering, have you ever turned down a meal? 
thanks for calling, Mildred. But again, uh, we'd like to keep this fishing relative if we could. Mildred? You gonna answer the question or no? <laughs> the hell do you think? Of course I haven't missed a meal. All right. <laughs> I love fishing and I love bacon and I love grilling food. Amen. And I sell beer now, so now I get to drink beer. There's calories in that. Let's get back to your pout. And how much I look like one? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> I was thinking more about the smell, but that's okay. If you were going to go eel pout fishing tonight, okay. what would be the list of items that you bring? And I know the, the coolest thing about eel pout fishing, I know this list isn't long. Right. In a perfect world, and I know this is a clam podcast and uh, whatever, but one thing I like about eel pout fishing is it's most years... You drive your truck out, set up in the spot, you drill a hole, and I like, I like to call it truck fishing. Yeah. That's what you typically get to do, fishing the spawn, pre-spawn, spawn bite. So, one, I need an ice auger. Ice auger. Two, I need a medium, medium heavy rod. Prefer a fiberglass. I need some glow-in-the-dark lures. I need something to glow those up. Here's a plug for Corey Studer and Vexlar. That glow ring is pretty slick. And uh, a headlamp's pretty nice, just for getting around in the dark. A light is easy to see. Um, long underwear, boots. Menos. Menos. That's really it, isn't it? A, vex, a, a graph of some sort. Yeah. I mean, how many years did I do this with Vexlar? I mean, that's, that's still all I own is a couple of Vexlars. Now I have, I don't own one yet because I'm a little behind the times and also not independently wealthy like you and have these forward facing sonars. But wow, was that uh, changed? change the game or or and one, th one thing that's I've, but I've found really cool in the last few years fishing with the forward face and sonar let me touch on this is how it's confirmed some things that I've often that I believed by drilling a pile of holes and fishing with a vexlar such as these fish follow each other mm -hmm. almost like like a game trail yeah it's a pout trail especially as you get near and nearer to the spawn you've noticed it yep. as, as, as the fish get closer to the spawn and this is one thing Matt taught me kind of check for how slimy they are. The slimier they are, and, it, and it's not, a pike is still a thousand times spi slimier than a, any eel pout, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, but as they near the spawn, they get a little more slimy. It seems like they're rubbing the bottom. Their belly always has some sort of substance on it. Siltiness. So, you know, siltiness, perfect, mm -hmm. thank you. And I've always thought had this picture in my mind basically like, especially when you're fishing with a group like we might be working a break these fish might not be necessarily coming from the deep up to shallow they might be running a lot parallel along the break in in 18 feet of water well if you're in 16 or you're in 20 you're not catching fish but if you're in 18 that's the the line they're running that night and and that forward facing sonar has really proved that I've i would seen, agree. i've seen i've seen it I would agree. Yet at the same time, the majority of the time for me, I'm fishing with my Vexlar. Oh, yeah, me, yeah. For sure. It's just easy to hop from hole to hole. Um, you know, you've, you've got the information that you need. Even with forward-facing sonar, you don't always see the fish. No, because they, they are running the bottom so tight, yeah. and depending on your bottom. Well, and a lot of times we're fishing breaks that are so sharp or rocks that present so much for a dead zone that it right. wouldn't matter what you're using for sonar, your, your feel and your visual is still way more important. Right. But, well, and then it's, you and, all, you and I have also built confidence in depths and areas and right. this and that where it's, boy, 15 years ago when I was 
fishing March 1st and the only person out on the lake in the middle of the night. Sure would have been nice to have that where you can see 80 <laughs> feet instead of drilling 15 over holes, but that's probably not drilling as many holes. Maybe that goes back to our collars and why I'm fat. <laughs> well, maybe you need to get an old gas auger. And Dull the blades up and work a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Make sure the carburetor's not working quite right, so you have to pull a lot. A thousand times. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were talking about bringing some glow baits with, I mean, how often do you actually bring a tackle box full of baits? If I'm like, if I'm on my snowmobile, I might throw a couple spoons, a couple jigs. I mean, I, there's, I don't, I have a Neil Pout tackle box. Yeah, I do yes. too. <laughs> and actually I've got... I've got one actual tackle box, and I've got two prepaid U.S. Postal Service boxes <laughs> from yes. the previous owner of uh, Big Nasty Tackle that he would just send me a box of jigs, and the, that's what they're, they're that's yeah. my tackle box. I still got two of those, and I've, then I've, now I've got new products coming from Matt, or you know some of the new stuff he's kicked out, and but. Uh, yeah, you don't, it's not like you're switching up colors or baits necessarily. If, if it glows and you got something on there that, that smells enough for them to eat, that's what you need. I totally agree with that. I, I too have an eel pout box that I typically leave at home. If you went out to my truck right now, you could probably find another eel pout tackle box of random things just floating around in the truck. <laughs> yep, yep, 100%. You know, if you looked under my seats, even if it was August. In my center console, I have a four ounce oh, yeah. glow bait right now. Yeah. That, that Big Nasty made for ocean fishing request. And I'm like, that doesn't really look that big. I should probably just try that at least one night. So I, Matt gave me one of them. But you remember, remember when we kind of first took, when I first introduced you to Powd, I'd been fishing yeah. for a few years. And, and I really didn't mess with stuff too much. I had the big nasty spoon and that's what I used and it worked, right? Like I didn't have, like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, then you kind of got me tinkering with baits. Do you remember the pout angel? The pout angel was beautiful. It was, and it caught fish. It caught fish on, on camera. On camera. Travis Frank and I got, uh, what was that, Minnesota bound. Yeah. I got, I got fish on film eating the pout angel. So you the pout angel was... Wasn't it a football head? That you had painted. Yeah, that painted with an ultra super glow paint that I found online. I'm just watching this guy on this snowmobile out on the lake right now who's going to catch his sled that he's pulling behind him in his track because he's whipping around so much. I'm like a squirrel. Pout angel. See, see a nut. Uh, and then the they pout had, angel. And my, then, my favorite thing was the... Six to eight inch skirt, glow, glow skirt that it came with. That after about mm, 13 minutes of fishing, I had in a giant knot because I <laughs> gummed her up with scent and, and just jigging it. The thing just, not, it was way too long. Yeah. It was beautifully it was ugly beautiful under, beautifully ugly first. underwater. At oh. first it was majestic, but after time... Yeah, I, I really got into the tinkering for a while. Like I was, I, I, I went down that same road with muskies when I was in my 20s. Like in the off season, I would be sharpening hooks and tying up bucktails and reading everything I could about muskies. And when you introduced me to eel pout, it was the same that the fever deal. that struck. Right. And I was just all about, I, I just ran into that box the other day that's got all these glow paints in it. I mean, all different kinds that I'd ordered online, which one's going to be the best and the most durable and all this stuff, oh, and yeah. all these fibers. And I even tried some like fiber optic stuff. And Oh, that, yep. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Rattle baits. Oh, that rattles like mad. Look like, look like Play-Doh. Yeah. Glow in the dark Play-Doh wrapped around it. Cause that paint's so thick. Yeah. And then now, I still tinker, don't get me wrong, but I've gone to 
I, mean, I still use the spoon from time to time because I think you get a little more glow, a little more flash. But I've kind of kind of tuned to that big single hook pout pounder. One, because you get into fish, way easier to unhook them. Way easier. Way, way easier. Because they, if you've never caught an eel pout, they really don't mess around. I mean, we're using one to one and a half ounce baits. I just told you that we're using, that I've got a four ounce bait that I'm not scared to use. I mean, that's how hard they, when they hit and, or suck in that bait, it's, they don't mess around. Um, so it's just way easier to unhook that single hook than it is a treble hook. But I'm still messing with that, with a, it's basically a, a lead head round jig yeah. with good glow paint on it. And wherever and however and whatever I can find rattles, I mean, I've tried them all, and whatever I can kind of get my hands on, adding those to the bait, I, I just makes me more confident. All right, well, Jason, you've gotten to do a lot of very interesting things with eel pout fishing, and I have too, uh, because of you. Because you introduced me to this crazy species, We've done a lot of cool things together. One that I've participated in, um, but you've done a lot more extensively with. Tell us about the Eel Pout Festival. Whenever you talk about Eel Pout, everybody brings up, oh, Eel the Pout Eel Festival. Pout Festival. Oh, the drunken chaos on, wa on Walker Bay. Um, yeah, I got, well, Matt Hood had been doing it for a while with uh, Leisure Outdoors. They were kind of heading up the the tournament side that was that was my involvement in it now there was the partying is one thing but there was actually people that got into the tournament and there was very nice very very nice prizes thank you jeff drew arnold reads um yeah. that was that's where they came from and uh you know i stepped in and got involved, and I don't even remember what year it was. Memories pop up, 2015, 16, 17, somewhere in that range. And, and then I kind of got a little rammy and a little pushy with, with uh, Jason Freed, was, who was kind of the uh, master, the grand master of this thing. And I said, we got to change this. I said, we can't have a pile. I mean, there was a lot of dead eel pout. I never saw, that pile was empty every night. People knew that they tasted good and that pile was empty. They came and got, like there was lots of people that came and yeah. they would grab 10 fish and then somebody else would come and grab 10 fish. Nobody like stole the whole pile and took them, but they would come and grab a few fish for themselves. And that pile was always gone. And the, but then I got involved and, and I pushed, and it wasn't just me, it was a mutual decision and I think People got thinking about it and like, hey, this is a native species. This isn't a gross fish. This is a freshwater cod. This is, this has its place in the ecosystem. So like the team tonnage thing went away. Right. You know, where it wasn't a free for all where you can bring in 400 eel pout and you weigh in 318 pounds or whatever. You know what I mean? For people that don't know, the team tonnage award would go to the group of people that weighed the, the most. The most. And I mean, they would go all out. Right. And I don't know what, I, you'd have to, I'm sure the numbers are somewhere, but I know they're pretty absurd. Yeah. I mean, like, I remember seeing them that it was like over 300 eel pout and the winning team would have, it was either. It'd be seven, 800 pounds yeah. at least. Maybe it was 300 pounds. I don't, you know, I don't recall exactly, don't but it was, I mean, it was hundreds of eel pout. I do know I that. weighed in hundreds of eel pout, and I want to say, I would guess your average fish was weighing two and a half, three pounds. And it got to the point, like, after that weekend of weighing in fish, I could look at an eel pout and tell you within ounces of how much it weighed. Oh, yeah. Just because you were, you weigh in that many fish, you know. Right. You, you know what I mean? But uh, I really like what we did towards the end. Uh, knocked her down to, like... We got rid of the team tonnage thing, um, just because it was it was dated, yeah. right? And made it like I think we did like four fish per person, and so there was you know if you had four ten pounders, you had four ten pounders, and uh, you had forty pounds. That'd be pretty dang solid. And then they always had the biggest 
biggest ten fish got a prize. The team there, and then your biggest four as a as a individual kind of went away from the team thing a little bit. I mean, they, we definitely changed it up, and then we really pushed bringing a man alive and and releasing as many as we could. Yeah, and we did a dang good job. I mean, the nice thing is, is the time of year it's still cold but it's not freezing cold i mean right. most years so a guy could go out these guys would go out fishing for the evening throw them in a big cooler or tubs and fill it with water and for the most part i mean those last couple of years i bet we released upwards to 80 percent of the fish if not higher i mean they were all we had holes drilled there close by and guys we had guys that that was their job to run fish and let those things go back into walker bay i mean it it definitely got to be preaching conservation. And the nice thing was those guys that were actually fishing the, con fishing the tournament gave, they gave a shit about the fish. Yeah. You know, they weren't, they weren't nailing to a board and hanging them up and like, look at my eight pound eel pout. Let's, right. let's crush beers. No, they were, they got it. They I, get it. I mean, I mean, Todd Felix is a guy I still follow on Facebook. That yeah. guy, that guy's been fishing eel pout. I mean, you talk about Dave Gens as a godfather. Todd Felix might be the godfather of, of eel pout fishing. I mean, his, his crew and that group, they were the ones that, when that tournament started, they were winning it. Right. Right? I actually did fish eel pout for the first time at the eel pout festival ever, before I fished with you. However, it was a little bit different. I went with my dad. I think I was probably 12 years old. And we drove over, it was like 30 below. I think we drilled one hole. Um, Sounds fun. I, yeah, I, I don't even remember really the fishing part. I remember we found a tip up frozen into a hole and I really wanted to spend the couple hours chiseling it out because hey, free tip up and you're 12. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you know, my dad didn't know what we were doing eel pout fishing. He thought you fished them like walleye. Right. And that's a lot of people that they, they go out and they catch. But it, it, not a bad analogy, really. It's not really. Maybe, How, there, there are some differences. Yep, maybe fish a little deeper, stay out a little later. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good starting point if I'm going to make it as easy as possible. Somebody right. wants to know how to fish eel pot. Right. Look, kind of look for wildlife spots, fish a little deeper, stay a little longer. It's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of walleye anglers that tangle with eel pot inadvertently mm. but and those those pretentious walleye fishermen <laughs> oh god this <laughs> my goodness they got their vests on is that what walleye with fishermen their, wear vests on with their rattle spoons in their the, vests and then they've got their jigging wraps you fish walleye sometimes in the summer you you Okay, so there's. I don't. I don't wallow fish much in the winter anymore. I hardly, hardly, rarely at all. Yeah. If it is, it's walking into a buddy's fish house, cracking a beer, trying to play, get to play a game of cribbage, and hopefully a rattle reel goes down. Well, true. And I don't. I don't chase them nearly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still do that. Do that annual annual early run up to Red Lake and kind of scratch that itch, and then chase some panfish and wait for yelp out season and. Going to Canada for lake trout. That's kind of ice fishing season for me nowadays. So there are a lot of walleye anglers that, while they're walleye fishing, they catch an eel pout. Right. You caught the opposite when we went up to Lake of the Woods. Yeah. We were fishing for eel pout. And what did you catch? Stupid walleye. <laughs> yeah, stupid big walleye. That was 29. My favorite part about that whole fish was Brett. Brett McComa sticking his entire body down the ice hole somehow. I mean, he's not a small man, but the only thing I could really remember seeing is his butt is a neck sticking up and grabbing that fish and pulling it up. Well, the it's thing is, incredible out, moment. out of all of us that are up there, Brett for sure had the shortest arms. No, yeah, probably. <laughs> I, think, was, I think my favorite part was that you set the hook on this fish and for whatever reason, I'm I don't fishing. know how you got in this position. I was on the opposite side of my snowmobile. Yeah, so you are fighting this fish with a snowmobile between you and the hole. Well, I was using my... Super long rod. 52-inch 
custom made lake trout eel pot slash eel pot rod. I got a 52 inch rod made and I had them lighten up the tip because I knew exactly what I wanted this rod for. I wanted it for targeting a big eel pot and, I, and, it was, and it's super durable for, for lake trout. It's the best of both worlds. Because if you, I've been blessed to, to be able to go to, to Northern Manitoba, you've been with me. Yeah. And we're, you watched me that afternoon have one of the most magical afternoons of my life where I, I think it was 11 eel pout in a row that were, every single one was about 30 inches, I which feel, is about like a nine, 10 pound fit. I feel like you bring that up a lot just because it really you, puts salt in the wound after, it hasn't been that many years, but I guarantee 20 years from now, when you bring it up, I'm still gonna get a little itchy over it. It's revenge from when you dumped our second place bag of fish in that derby right back into the lake and we got 16th oh, place. Oh boy, that was a memory. Yeah, so let's. For the so listeners, I literally starfished on the dock and um, our way bag blew up. That was open water, of course. Mm. That was uh, horrendous. Yeah, we, we, it was a multi-species tournament. So imagine we have a way bag with three Fif pike. 15 fish in it. Three pike, six walleye. Six bass. Six bass? Yep. I don't know what the bass limit is. Yeah. I should. I love eating them now. <laughs> have you ever had pickled bass? No. I'm, okay. That's a, that's. Bass, bass fishermen, don't get mad at me right now. Because these bass came out of a private lake that the guy wants them out of. My high school science teacher. Who I know. John Kent. Mm -hmm. Bless our amazing human being. Uh, is retired. Works part time for my brother now. And was actually up in Bemidji here just a couple weeks ago, and we went fishing for the morning. Uh, he was getting recertified for some scuba stuff. Him and his wife are actually going to the Galapagos Islands. Cool. In fact, I think they're probably there right now. Anyway, brings me some of his pickled fish. It's pike and northern. The man's recipe is unbelievable. Best pickled fish I've ever had in my life. Really? Some secret ingredients. But the bass pickled. Hmm. I, I, a thousand I, times over the pike. Firmed up a little better. It's a bigger chunk of meat. It was life changing. You know my recipe for pickled fish? Eat all the pickles, put the fish in the jar. Really? No, I don't make pickled I'm fish. I was going to say, I don't think that works like no, that. I don't think it does. It's does a either. different thing. Uh, when, when you back to that, that big walleye that you caught on accident while fishing eel pout. When you had them design that rod, did you ask them, could you make it long enough so I can fit a snowmobile between my stomach and the hole? Um, no, I love long rods for ice fishing because let's go back to my broken ass knees. Mm -hmm. Or the, the gout and arthritis. It's a real thing. Like I watch these guys kneel down by the hole and jig like I used to. And I, like I, I, I'm in pain just watching and like, I can do it. I just can't do it very long and I can't get back up. So I prefer long rods, but especially for lake trout and burbot fish that you're more aggressively jigging, the longer the rod, the less work I have to do to get the action. Right. Yeah. And I just asked, asked the guys like, how long a rod could you make? And they're like, we could, yeah, 52. And I said, 52, shave down that end, make that tip a little lighter. And they're like, you got her, bud. And uh, bless their hearts, they got, it's, it's a black rod with a white tip. It looks like the old school uh, ugly stick. Sweet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun thing. But the reason I was doing that was because the guys have been fishing and they've been catching all these toolies all day. Yeah. And I didn't bring really small, um, we were on an eel pout trip. Why the hell would I bring small jigs, right? Or even light, I didn't even bring light rods with. Right. I was there to catch eel pout, not. And we caught crappies that morning too. Yeah, same thing, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, wow, whatever. I just put on a, I had a big little Clio. Little Clio. It like was three, three quarter ounce glow. Gross. Yeah, big, I gobbed her up with a bunch of stuff and I just was ripping that all day. I'm like, all these toolies around, there's going to be a big pike, big walleye, big bird. Something's going to be around, right? And I wasn't wrong. You weren't wrong. I only cut. I had that fish on my screen before I cut. You. Well, you didn't have the right bait. I didn't. Or the touch. <laughs> and uh, I caught that, and then shortly right after that, I caught a bird. Yeah. 
on the same lure. Let's talk a little bit about that Lake of the Woods trip because we went up with Linder Media and uh, we had aspirations to catch a giant. I believe our timing was early March, right? Yeah. Which when we got back, come to find out, I think Jeremy Smith had talked to a biologist and we found out that the eel pout on Lake of the Woods, at least Big Travers, happened to spawn earlier. Yeah. They end up spawning, the, it, 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 their spawn kind of happens, has already happened, end of February. So we kind of missed the, uh, missed the deal. Um, but, you know, we went up to the angle and fished a rumored spot. I think we got one burbot up there, a few walleyes, kind of a bust. It was a, it was an interesting trip up there because we were staying at Arneson's, Arneson's on the south side and it was about a 50 mile run by snowmobile. Prob up, to, up to the island. Yeah, yeah up, up probably the, the longest run I've ever made on snowmobile because I'm not a snowmobiler. My, my sled is totally utilitarian. I'm only taking it from the access to my fishing spot. Right. Yeah. So, it's same as same as me. So yeah, it was a long run, and Brett McComa started on fire. Yeah, there was a there were flames. An incident with that. There was a little snowmobile that started on fire, and and that was a good learning lesson too because we just had to abandon the sled. Yeah, adapt and overcome. And fortunately, we had a guy with us who was a, he was our guide, even though he didn't fish. Right. And he just said, I'll take care of it. And the next day he went, drove all the way up there with his snowmobile. Yeah, it was one of, one of the Arneson employee guys, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he totally took care and of it. And he just took the belt off the sled and hooked up a jerk strap to it and towed it all the way all back. Way and I, I remember when we were talking about what do we compensate this guy for, you know, taking care of the sled. And I said, well, there's seven of us, a hundred bucks a piece. And somebody said, you think that much? And I said, well... Would you pay $100? We would have lost a day of fishing to go retrieve that sled. I said, would you oh, pay... Right. Solid half a day, yeah. Yeah, I said, would you would you pay $100 to get a day of fishing back? And everybody said, oh, 100%. When you put it like that, mm -hmm. that makes complete sense. Yeah. Oh, it was well worth it. But what a... It was, it was a fun trip. It was... The, the excitement was around it with the number of us that we had up there. But just the vast size of Big Traverse Bay in and of itself. Oh. With such, I mean, yes, there's structure, but you know, from my experience fishing these eel pot around here, Lake Bemidji, catching them in 11 feet of water, knowing that's about their spawn depth. Cast Lake looking at it where they're spawning in, in 20 some feet. Okay, let's look at 11 to 20 feet on Lake of the Woods. Right. In Big Traverse Bay. Right. There's a lot of territory there that you can fiddle around with, that's for sure. Oh, well, there's a handful of acres, right? Right. So, I mean, we chased, we, we did our research, and especially Jeremy, uh, bless his heart, you know, he's looking back, he's making calls, contacts, Chasing rumors, and then of course the one guy that calls him back, some DNR guy, he's like, "Oh yeah, this is after we got back." He's like, "Oh yeah, I kind of find they they seemed like they spawned the end of February, yeah. and we're up there a week after that or whatever it was." But I mean, it would definitely be fun to go back up there and mess around again and try to figure. Because boy, if you could find a spawning area, oh my gosh, your well, chance, your chance at at that fish, I mean, that's, that's where you're going to get a 20 pounder you see in these, Minnesota. You see these giants that are caught up there by people in wheelhouses or rentals, you know, that are fishing walleyes and some rogue person catches, you know. A, well, they catch them out right there. Uh, they're, that was 80% of the feedback we got from talking to people like, oh, yeah, just go out in the mud. We get them every once in a while. There's no, there's no consistency. There's no anything. consistency. Yeah, you just, you go out, you just go out there and, yeah, you catch them. You don't see people up on Lake of the Woods. You, you, you don't see them like, oh, we had a 40 eel pout day. No, it's, uh, we caught. about that. Uh, we stayed out too late and we caught one. 
Right. Uh, we, got, we got one at three o'clock in the afternoon, and then we did catch a second one at five. Right. You know, nobody's nobody's up there catching. Nobody's staying until eleven o'clock at night like we are on some lakes to be like, well, I've caught twenty five. I'm gonna go call her a night and going home. Right. You know, it's it's nothing like that. But you know, less than a mile from right here is an old state record mounted sitting in a bait shop. Right, from Lake of the Woods. From Lake of the Woods. And I would say if you're, you know, one of my dreams in life is to catch a 20 pound deal pup. I was just gonna ask you, have you envisioned that fish? Have you thought about, oh, if I could catch the state record eel pup? Don't care about state record, I want a 20 I pound. I want a 20 pounder. I care about the state record. I don't care where to catch it. Oh, I don't care. If it's either. Ontario, if it's Manitoba, if it's uh, if it's going over and flirting with the Conrad boys and seeing if they can get me a twenty pounder. Who hold the world record. At twenty five whatever, twenty five and change. It's an incredible fish. Um We took a we took a fun trip together. And McComas was with on that one too. To northern Manitoba. Northern Ma- northwestern Manitoba to Wacusco Falls Lodge, which was unbelievable. I mean, you, you and I had never been there before. Right. Do you remember that one afternoon I had? <laughs> was, was it 11 fish? I think it was 11. 11 over, master 11, anglers? 11, 11 30 inch eel pot in a row. <laughs> with, just, with the lake show mixed in. Yeah. With the owner of the resort, Brian Bogdan, 10 feet away. He's like, let's have a contest. Yeah, I do remember that. And for some reason, I don't know what I was in the here again. That day again proves, and that was that was before forward face and sonar. We were straight up vaxies. Yep. I was on the. I picked the hole. I was on the path. I yeah. was on that game trail. I was on you that were. pout trail. I would agree. Because Brian Brian was literally fishing. Twelve feet away. I was sitting, in, and that was. I mean, that was my dream day of fishing. I'm fishing eel pout during the day in northern Manitoba. I saw a caribou on my way to the lake, and I'm truck fishing, you know, sitting with my butt up on my, the side of my Suburban, blocking the wind, just dream trip, dream fishing, you know, and then... You know, the streak like might catch five 30-inch burbot, and then all of a sudden some 26-inch lake trout screws it up, and I ruin my burbot streak. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. If, oh, if you just, haven't looked into Wacusco Falls Lodge, you know, one of the cool things, I, you know, obviously the fish that we caught, unbelievable, whether it was the eel pout or the lake trout or the pike. You didn't go with when we did the tip-ups for pike because you would have had to exercise too much. But And I was crushing yeah. Doing what I was doing. Right. Oh, and then what did you forget about the walleyes? Yeah. I mean, we didn't even bring up the walleyes. It was unbelievable. But one of the memories that stands out to me is that first night that we stayed there and I woke up in the morning and I could hear this sound. And I, I thought to myself, man, the wind today, the wind is just howling. Oh, do you mean the waterfall that's yeah. 12 feet from the <laughs> cabin door? Yeah. You yeah. step outside and there's rapids oh. right outside the door. You pee yourself three times at night, but you sleep like a baby. Like a baby. Oh. Unbelievable. I would go up there again in a and heartbeat. Brian, and we've and been Brian, up there before. Brian and Alyssa? More than once. Wonderful salt people. Salt of the earth. Oh, my gosh. Great people. I, I will be back. I am going mm-hmm. back. I don't know when, but at some point, yes, 100%. Yeah. And it will be mid-April lake trout and burbot fishing now i do have to correct one fact in your recollection of that amazing day and that was that you said you saw a caribou on the way to the lake which was it is on not the way, true it was, was it on the way home it was on the way home and it was actually easter it was on easter oh that's right we called it the easter reindeer yeah you you were driving and you put both hands in the air and you said yes i saw a reindeer on easter you know, woodland, what, a woodland caribou. How lucky are we, though, that our families just said, okay, you can not be here for Easter and all the things that we celebrate and the traditions and everything. You get to go fishing up 12, 13 hours north of home. 
You did 16. Well, whatever. I drive fast. Yeah, we're very, very blessed, very lucky. Um, probably because we're very underwhelming to our own family. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, dude, go ahead. I don't, yeah, get well, out yeah, of here. Perfect. It's probably easier without you. More food yeah, for we us. We don't have to make as much ham fatty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Well, I have just a couple more things uh, to bring up. And one I know that is very sentimental to you and hopefully not too hard to talk about. Yeah. Tell me about your dad. My dad? That is tough to talk about. He's been gone two and a half years. And the, the, he got me into the outdoors, got me into, helped me get into fishing. Terrible fisherman. <laughs> wasn't good at all. We, uh, one of my favorite memories of fishing with my dad. I was probably sixth, seventh grade. And we had a, at that point, it was like the first boat dad had bought us. And like a 12 footer, 14 footer with like a 10 horse. He was like, let's go, we're gonna go fishing and we're gonna go to Sewell Lake. Okay. We'll get it to Sewell Lake. It's like a Sunday afternoon after church we go out fishing. And it's like, I don't remember. It was summertime, right? I don't, I don't know if we had a depth finder on this boat, right? Right. We're walleye fishing. So we just whatever. And like my brother and I were like, whatever, we're, we're in the boat. It's just fun. So remember dad having a bottle of brandy and some Diet Coke with. <laughs> And he has a couple cocktails and we're fishing and not, we didn't catch up. We never caught them, maybe a pike or two. And after he got a couple cocktails down, well, boys, um, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina. And then he went, that was our, he gave you the talk, the talk out in the boat in this thing. And, that and was, how that's old were you? Oh, sixth, seventh grade, whatever, about the talk time. About the time. Yeah, and my, and my little brother's with, and he's like, I remember him like, well, the problem we missed the boat with you, Jason, it was probably a little too late to probably know more <laughs> than I do, and my little brother's, like, whatever, you know. Do you and Dallas still talk about that? Oh, yeah, we brought it up a few times. We brought it up a few times, but, uh, but he loved pushing us to the outdoors, and, like, and Dad took... I started going up in like fifth, sixth grade with another buddy of mine that graduated with me and, and his dad going up to Canada. And we did that trip up until right before COVID, before, about, the time dad, about the time my dad got real sick and wouldn't be able to pull that trip off was about the time COVID hit and we couldn't cross the border anyway. Right. And uh, so we did that trip from fifth grade till I was 38, 39, whatever, however old I was. So 28 years or whatever. Wow. And then the big thing dad loved hunting and our, we've got a deer shack up in the middle of nowhere by Little Fork and really awful, okay deer hunting. You know, you sit for four or five days and if you see a deer, plus your heart hopefully has <laughs> got antlers and you can shoot it. Very few doe tags, uh, but that was that was his jam and his passion was going up there. You know, my grandpa, which would have been my my mom's dad, started going up there in the late '40s, early '50s. Dad got hooked up with my ma, and dad got the invite, which coincided pretty well because one of my dad's best friends was involved in this camp. Another guy he grew up with, so. You know, that's really where I got my outdoor education was was his his passion for the outdoors was up at the shack. Knew that I had a passion for fishing and loved it and did what he could to get me out even though he didn't have a, he didn't have a clue. I mean, bless his heart, he did what he could. But boy, as I got older and I figured it out, my brother figured it out. Those last handful of years in Canada, he was living the dream. Oh, I bet. He'd sit in the boat. My brother would drive the trolling motor. He'd sit in the driver's seat of his, of his Crestlander console and 
jig over the side and he'd break a line or he'd catch a fish and I'd take it off and retie and do whatever. He never he had to get up. I'd bait it for him and he was living the dream. He loved it when his boys were taking him fishing and god damn I'd give anything I could for one more day in the boat with him. I bet. It's tough. And here's the thing and, and especially for people that are listening is that you know you didn't know when you were a young kid, you didn't know that your dad wasn't the best fisherman. Oh, hell no. Looking back and now I know, yeah. Now, yeah, looking back, you know, but. And if he was sitting right here, I'd tell him, like, you were awful. <laughs> and he would be like, he would go, yep. <laughs> I mean, the one thing I was blessed with, his brothers, my Uncle Jim and my Uncle Butch, who were both around today and both who I need to get in the boat because they both took me a lot as a kid, too. They knew I was into it. And they did the best they could, despite they having their own kids. They got me out fishing as well. I've been to Lake Michigan fishing with my uh, with my uncle Jim, and my uncle Butch was the first person that ever took me out musky fishing. And uh, you know, Uncle Butch, if you're listening, you you weren't that great a musky fisherman. <laughs> Boy, I could teach you some stuff nowadays. And Uncle Jim, you're stuck in your ways, so you ain't gonna catch any salmon on Lake Michigan anymore. You gotta get out of those old stuck ways. But heck, they don't they don't want to listen to their young dumb nephew no more. <laughs> I didn't know this was gonna be a coming to terms episode. With him, yeah. I'll, <laughs> but, I'll send them. I'll send them both a link so they can get their they can get yeah. their education. But no, bless them both. They did. They they both took me out and and. Uh, really grew grew my passion for fishing I mean, and the really my grandpa my my dad's dad passed away before I was born so I never knew my grandpa Rylander mm-hmm. it was my mom's dad that uh, that took me out fishing a, a heck of a lot when I was a kid and that was the full process as the Canadians would say <laughs> we would I'd get to his house we'd go to the garden with uh, the fork and dig up angleworms. We grab them, then we jump in his little Ford truck, drive out to the lake, and we would fish bluegills from shore with the angleworms. Then go home, clean the bluegills, and I don't remember us ever keeping very big bluegills. These, sure, these whatever. I don't remember us releasing very many either. <laughs> you know, like we we were cleaning what we caught type of deal. Sure, but. And we go back to his place, and he had a little cleaning table deal. He did it kind of out in the grass. Take the fillets in, and we'd have a nice fish fry, and just those. And that's probably why I still have my love for my favorite fish to eat is bluegill. Yeah. The little Even fish. more than pickled bass? Uh, mm, that pickled bass is good. I'm going to change your <laughs> life. I'm going to get you some. Um, those, the smaller-ish bluegills, those seven, eight-inch bluegills. Yeah. Uh, fried, skin off, potato chips. Yeah. You know. But then the guts would go right back into the garden where we grab the worms. It was cool. Like I just full circle. Like, yeah. And I remember doing that a ton in the summer. Well, what I was saying to people listening is that even though you might not be the best angler, even though you might not have enough know how to do much more than start the boat. It doesn't matter. Take your kid fishing. Take your kid fishing. Take the, the, a kid. A kid. Yeah. A if couple kids. If you don't have kids, take the neighbor kid. Yeah. Don't steal them out of their yard or anything, but yeah, ask, ask them. Ask mom's permission. Ask, ask dads permission. Are, dads don't give a shit. Just ask mom. <laughs> um, but yeah, get get the kids out there because the impact, the lifelong impact is I have, absolutely unbelievable. So my boys, yeah, whatever, like. I don't force them to go fishing. Every once in a while I do. I don't make them go fishing. It's, right now it's not their thing. My oldest son's 13. He had a sleepover with a buddy. And I brought this kid home and we were chatting. He's like, you been fishing lately? And I was like, that's an awesome question. I said, I have not. I said, do you like fishing? And he goes, I love fishing. And I said, oh. And we started chatting a little bit, and the eel pout got brought up. Sure. And I said, would you, have you ever caught an eel pout? And he goes, no. I said, do you want to catch one? And he goes, this nods his head. He's like, I watched this kid go from 
nervous with from like I'm I mean, nervous from sitting in the like he see he was nervous he was on edge when he got in the truck and he lives seven miles from our house or whatever and, and I'm like would you like to go should we should we when they bite's good I'll get I'll take you in Arizona he goes oh man could can we could we can we and I drop him off and. And a few nights later, we were at a school function, and I ran into his dad. And like I knew who his dad was, we were shake hands and we're talking. And he goes, "Yeah, my kid mentioned something maybe about fishing." And I'm like, "Yeah," I said, "I'd love to if it works out or whatever. Can I take him?" He goes, he goes, "Yeah, I think we could do that." And then the kid's like, "Dad, Dad, he's he's been on TV. Dad, he's been on TV. <laughs> like, I, you can't say no, Dad. You know, so like, that's cool." Yeah, that's that's really cool. I'm I'm excited. Like I want, and but what the fun thing for me is, I have alternative motives. One, I'm gonna blow that kid's mind. He's gonna catch his first eel pout, and I get to be a part of that. It's gonna right. be super fun. Two, my kid's gonna go with. Right. And I get one more little nudge to get him into it. I'm never gonna force it on him. I don't want to force it on him. I think if you force it on him, it, it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. I want it to be their decision. And the funny thing is, every once in a while I do like, boys, get Let's in the boat, go. get Let's in the go. boat, or yeah. get in the truck, we're going fishing. And the funny thing is, when we go, they have a blast. Right. And then they're, but I'm like, hey, you guys want to go, like a week later, I'm like, you guys want to go fishing? Yeah, there's a Fortnite tournament. <laughs> Good old Fortnite. Well, I have to... And wrapping all of this up, and I appreciate you sitting down with me. It's good that our video cut out because I can barely see you across the table no, it's, in this it's, dim lit this bar. This is romantic. It's pretty romantic, actually. I should have brought a candle. Are you? Uh, did you order the lobster? <laughs> I did not yet. Yeah, yeah. You're buying dinner, so mm -hmm. I bought last time. We'll leave the tab. Dars will buy. Oh yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we we'll put it on. Sure the, we'll put it on the manager's tab. Yeah. <laughs> but I need to thank you for forcing me to go eel pout fishing. It was almost a force, wasn't it? It was, because Jason reached out to me on social media. We had a lot of mutual friends. We had never met each other. and we, I was doing the sweet art on, on the internet yeah, at that point. That's when you sweet, fell in love with me. Sweet art. Uh, by but art, I had to... Kid by art, he means he was using... What was uh, Microsoft it? Paint. Microsoft Paint and painting uh, Stickman. Stickman stuff. Stickman. Wait a second. Uh, National Anthem. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's a hockey game going on Oh, tonight. that's what it is. Yeah, okay. that's people, people watching the hockey game. Should we pause? Take off our hats? No, I don't think we can work through it. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I want It's not live. It's on TV. Okay. I want to say thank you for making me go, really, because otherwise I wasn't that interested. And for people that are listening that go, you'll probably aren't that interesting to me. Do it once. Go out there and actually try to catch, catch a fish, catch yeah. an eel pout. And, and let them go. And let it go. Let them let go. Let them go. Um, that first also, night we went, we got like there. 13. And wasn't that good? I, and I told you that night, I'm like, that wasn't very good. Right. And you were like, that was kind of fun. That was a lot of fun. And then we did it again. Yeah. And again and again and again. Yeah. Thank so, goodness I'm decent at eel pout fishing. And push you to go else we would have never become friends. Right. And I consider you a good friend. Same. I am so gracious and grateful and I'm thankful for you yeah. every day. Well, most days. Yeah. Well, our personalities click and we're yeah. both. I'm funny and you're kind of funny. Yeah. Um, hey, last year when we went to uh, an event for Clam and we were shooting all of the new gear for this year... Um, there was one particular garment that you wore on your hands that you really liked. Oh, those gloves, those, uh... Vertex. Yeah. They were unbelievable. Like, they were, they're, I mean, I know this is a nice team in a clown podcast. They're not cheap. No. But... I've worn a ton of clam gloves that are that are waterproof. Your hand stays dry, but they absorb moisture. Right. This glove, I'm filming with Joe, and I'm putting my hand in the water over and over and over, and we're 
doing something with this crappie and filming this piece. And I'm like, honest to God, I'm like, I'm putting my hand in the, in the hole, down the hole. And I'm telling Joe, I'm like, I don't even, most times when you stick your hand in the water, like the glove kind of absorbs it and you can kind of feel like the water pressure. The pressure, yeah. This glove was like nothing. Right. And you pull it out and there's nothing. I remember. It doesn't, it, that material that they've, they've come up with, it doesn't absorb any water. It's, and it breathes. It's, it's, if you need a good pair of gloves, it's worth every penny, 100%. Yeah. I remember you quoting to me, I had my hand in the water over and over, and I couldn't even tell it was in the water. Couldn't, 100%, could not tell it was in the water. Yeah. I got a pair of those gloves this year, and it's honestly the best pair of gloves I've ever owned in my life. Uh, when we went fishing with Jason Mitchell, I noticed right away that he had them on, and I, I go, what do you think of those, the Vertex gloves? And he goes, best glove I've ever owned. So to say thank you, you got me a pair of uh, the brown chamois <laughs> gloves. <laughs> no, I actually got you a pair of the Vertex gloves oh. for introducing me to the lovely world of eel pout fishing. Well, you're amazing. I know. They're a size small. <laughs> no, is that, they're a, not. is that a joke? No, they're not. You just can't see in this dimly lit bar. Can't even put my thumb in there. No, they're <laughs> perfect. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. They are, uh, and, you know, the, I know you got to do your plugs for clam. No, actually, and we all on do, the but show, these we are, don't. But, in 100%, the most ridiculous glove yeah. I've ever put on my hand. I've, I hate to say that I've actually had these for quite a while. To give to you. Oh, think, well, now that winter's over, here's the, yeah. here's the greatest <laughs> pair of glove I've ever put on. Right. Thanks. Well, I kept forgetting and stuff, so. No, no right. worries. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's You're awesome. You're Those welcome. are, uh, I know the price point on them for you folks at home is a little intimidating, but I can tell you that you put them on and you take care of them, you won't need another set of gloves ever. It's kind of like a, a really good high quality pair of sunglasses. You take care of them. You don't lose them. You don't right. put them lens down in the gravel. Right. I mean, like my program with, with my clam order every year is I love the cheaper, lighter ones. Just you just don't really get hand warmers most of the time and whatever. And, I always order three, four pairs because guess what happens? You lose one glove. Yep, and we should pair yeah. ours up. I wonder if they're no, because I lose a left glove every time. So I have fourteen. That's what I, do too. I have fourteen right gloves, and yeah. I'm assuming you do too. I actually counted the other day. Um, I have seven. <laughs> I have seven right hand gloves, and I can't bring myself to get rid of them. So my solution to not losing my gloves, I just keep them in my truck. The problem is. We are fishermen, <laughs> so what happens? You still they, no, they get wet, or oh, this yeah. happens, or yeah, or they get t tucked under the seat, or your kid does kid stuff. But yeah, I've lost a lot fewer, but I've also like like okay, I'm going fishing, get out there and put this glove on. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot last time I went fishing, I got them super wet. I have I have this vision that when I die and go to heaven that you get a lot of information. That's spend, a big assumption. You, you spend the rest of eternity <laughs> figuring out this stuff in life. And one thing that I'm going to, like, I think there's a computer there that you can just type in whatever you want and it'll, you know, show you a playback of your, of your life. And what I'm going to spend probably a year on, because I have eternity to do this, is just see where I lost all of these gloves. gloves in my lifetime. That and socks. Socks, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you and you and seven billion moms will be on that sock sock program. <laughs> I know that is at our house. Oh my sock. gosh, the land yeah. of mismatched socks. <laughs> we have a we have a we have a laundry bin just for mismatched socks. That just eventually she's like, well, there's got to be matches in there. Look at it; it's like a foot deep. I actually don't wear matching socks. I purposefully wear mismatched socks. That sounds about right, because then who cares? Yeah, but with gloves, it's hard to grab two and fit them on your hands. Right. It doesn't work quite right. Well, we've gone from talking eel pout to talking socks, so I think it's time for us to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, we probably run on the thing, so. Yeah. 
Jason, I just want to thank you for being on with me tonight, putting up with uh, my antics and just being you. Yeah, and uh, just one thing before we go. Yeah. To those callers, um, you were rude. Those are mean, mean questions, disrespectful. Um, I've got their numbers on my caller ID, so if, I can. And if you I can and if know. you're mad that I said that and you're offended, um, I'll give you Thane Jensen's number with Clam. <laughs> he's not in customer service anymore, but he's very good at handling that kind of stuff, and he'll take care of you. <laughs> well, this is Jason Durham for the po- uh, Ice Team Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Make sure if you want to listen to back episodes or check out the upcoming episodes, you can always find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on YouTube. And of course, follow Ice Team on our social media, Facebook and Instagram, and keep in touch. We want to see what you catch, and we're wishing everybody a great rest of the ice season. Get out there, catch some fish, hopefully catch some eel pout, and let the meal pot go. Let the meal pot go. And I'm telling you to be safe, be smart, and be a hero. Take someone fishing. <laughs>